Hello, everybody. We'll wait a um, few more minutes, let some more people join, and then we will get rock and rolling. Um, everyone, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up so I know um, that my audio is working. Perfect. Perfect. Looks like it's sounding good. So we'll wait a few more minutes and we'll get rocking and rolling. All right, we will get started, um, and then hopefully some people will kind of join as we as we go um, and as we get this thing rock and rolling. So I am Dr. Perry Maynard. There's some names that I see that look familiar, uh, and then there's some names that I don't recognize. So welcome, uh, great to have you. Um, we do these webinars honestly about once a week. Myself, Dr. Stedman, um, and Jake, who's our counselor, on on various different topics. So so tonight we are going to talk about do I have a concussion, right? Today's talk, what I wanted to really focus on is what is a concussion? And then how do I really know if I've had one? So many people have accidents, hit their head, um, different things occur. And then they think, well, I don't know. I went to the ER and the doctors there, the neurologist said that I looked fine. There wasn't a brain bleed. Maybe I have a little bit of concussion, but what does that mean? What does that mean? And then what should someone do to properly get assessed to see if they really do have a concussion? So before we get started, for those of you who don't know me, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. So I am one of the lead clinicians at Integrated Health Systems in Inglewood, Colorado, which is about 15 minutes south of Denver, right? So in that practice, a majority of the patients that I see are individuals suffering from traumatic brain injuries, uh, sports-related concussions, uh, inner ear disorders from different types of inner ear infections to autoimmune diseases, really all sorts of different types of neurological and autoimmune conditions is a majority of my patient base that we see. And we do a lot with um neurologic rehabilitation, a lot with functional medicine principles in order to help patients in that arena. So I have training in um, TBI rehabilitation, uh, vision therapy, vestibular rehab, along with manual therapy as well, right? So let's get rocking and rolling. What is a concussion? There's so much confusing information out there. Some still think that you got to be knocked unconscious to suffer a concussion. You know, I played football competitively my entire life all the way through college. And for the longest time, it was, well, if I didn't lose consciousness or wasn't completely disoriented, throwing up everywhere, well, it must not be a concussion. It must not be that bad. Those subtle headaches that are just there every day, those might not be, un those might be unrelated. Those may be something totally separate, right? But as we'll talk is there can be so many different signs and symptoms that we can pay attention to in ourselves, but also loved ones to know really when to get help, right? So to get started, let's talk about how a concussion is defined. So if we look at the consensus statement from the Berlin uh, kind of consensus um, that occurs every four years, right? So there's a, a concussion panel that occurs every four years in different countries, and it takes the world's leading experts in sports-related concussions, and they come up with guidelines, what treatments are effective. They review all the research, and they say, what do we know about concussions, and what do we want to change about our thoughts about concussions? So let's see what they have to say about concussions. All right, so they define concussion as a traumatic brain injury induced by biomechanical forces, maybe caused either by direct blow to the head 
face, neck, or elsewhere on the body with an impulsive force transmitted to the head. This is really important. A lot of individuals think, well, I didn't get directly hit in the head. I Maybe I fell on my butt and my head got whipped back. So I'm probably good. I probably didn't have a concussion. Or maybe I got rear-ended in my car. I didn't hit my head, but my head got jarred back and forth, right? Or falling skiing, whatever it may be, right? And this is really important is that you don't have to hit your head to produce a concussion. If you think about your brain, your brain is just a big ball of really gooey fat, right? And it sits inside this really small case with some fluid. And anytime there's an acceleration, deceleration, so you go from moving really quickly to not moving anymore, the brain bounces around within that skull, right? And that is what can create a concussion. So you can see that you don't necessarily need to take a hit to the head in order to suffer a concussion. That's one really important part. Okay. Also, typically results in rapid onset of short-lived impairment of neurological function that resolves spontaneously. However, in some cases, signs and symptoms evolve over a number of minutes to hours. I would even argue days. It's not uncommon to see patients where they suffer head injury, they feel good, and then a week later, all of a sudden, all these symptoms come on. Right. So. Sometimes symptoms occur right away, sometimes hours, sometimes days, sometimes even weeks and months after. Um, and rare occasions, sometimes even years after, symptoms can start to manifest. So that's another important thing to note is say, well, I hit my head a few months ago. That can't be related, but a lot of times it can be related. The timeline can be different for every person. And thirdly, may result in neuropathological changes, but the acute clinical signs and symptoms largely reflect a functional disturbance rather than structural injury, right? Such as that there's no abnormality seen on imaging. For those of you who are listening to them, this who have suffered a head injury yourself or know a loved one that has, a majority of the time imaging is normal and people are told that they're fine and nothing's wrong. But when you look at the research and you look at things clinically, concussions truly are a functional injury, right? There's not true pathological or anatomical change to the brain things just become a little wonky, right? The way circuits fire together, they just don't oscillate appropriately and that's what creates symptoms. And that's why imaging is negative. Imaging is great to, to, to rule out bleeds and more serious things, but really isn't much help in regards to um, managing concussions. So when doctors are running imaging over and over again, they say it's normal and you say, well, I don't feel normal. That's because something is still most likely going on and the imaging just will never tell you that, right? So Really three things that are important to know is that one, you don't have to take a direct hit to the head to suffer concussion. Two is symptoms can happen right away or days, hours, weeks, or months later. And then also that it's a functional injury and a majority of the times imaging is negative. And just because imaging is negative doesn't mean that you are okay and everything is okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what even happens during a concussion right because the better we can understand what happens on a chemical metabolic and a, a neural circuitry standpoint the better we can understand what therapies are going to be effective and then also make sense of symptoms that's the scary part with head injuries is so many people have numerous amounts of symptoms and a lot of times very similar symptoms, but they can be for completely different reasons. Okay. And as we understand what occurs during a concussion, those will make more sense. Okay. So I always talk to patients when I first see them and say, there's really two big things that happens with a head injury. One is there's a, a metabolic or a chemical consequence. And two, there is more of an issue in affecting the circuitry or the way different networks communicate, right? So you go from, you know, from a metabolic standpoint, you go from being a fuel efficient Prius getting 40 miles to the gallon to a guzzling truck getting 10 miles to the, to the gallon, right? And then on the structural side, you go from being high speed internet, right, that we all love to AOL dial-up, if some of us remember that, of taking forever to get a connection, right? So let's talk a little bit about the metabolic consequences because these are going to create different symptoms and there's different ways you approach and you treat these things, right? So when you hit your head, some of the big things that happen is your brain's ability to utilize energy becomes inefficient. So like I said, you go from being a Prius, getting 40 miles to the gallon, 
to being a gas guzzling truck, SUV, whatever, getting 10 miles to the gallon, right? This is why a lot of people wake up and they said, my symptoms aren't too bad in the morning, but by afternoon I'm wrecked and I just can't get back with it until I lay down for a few hours or I go to bed, right? You're looking at an energy crisis, right? So your ability to utilize glucose or sugar for fuel, proteins, fats becomes very inefficient. And this is sometimes where you can see things like ketogenic diets or using different things as a fuel source can be effective in certain cases. And that's why largely a ketogenic diet is, can be effective with concussions, especially early on, is it helps to stabilize fuel and make the brain run a little bit more efficient, right? The other thing is that your brain becomes hyper excitable. So you start releasing all these excitatory neurochemicals. This is your patients where they become very sound sensitive, light sensitive. They become so sensitive to stimulus because their brain is so ready to fire that any little stimulus sets it off, right? And this is where a lot of people like sitting in a dark room because any sort of sensory input is just too much for them, right? Those are really the big things. Another big thing from a metabolic standpoint is there's alterations in the way the immune system works, right? So the immune system in your brain and then the immune system in the rest of your body should be separate, right? So there's a lot that we'll talk about theories of your, your brain should be relatively immune naive. There shouldn't be a lot of uh, immune reactivity going on there. And what happens in the rest of the body really has no business ending up in the brain. But unfortunately, whenever we hit our head, the barrier system that separates the rest of our internal brain and blood system and immune system from the external or the rest of the body's immune system becomes more permeable. This is why some individuals can have pre-existing infections that maybe they're managing that are going throughout their body and then all of a sudden they suffer a head injury and now those reactive immune cells now move into the brain. And this can cause and wreak havoc and cause all sorts of inflammation in the brain. And this is why a lot of times you may see, and there a great colleague of mine out of um, San Francisco, Dr. Sergio Azzolino, just published a paper on this of looking at the consequence of Lyme disease and concussions and showing severity and persistence of post-concussive syndrome being associated with Lyme in different tick-borne illnesses. And the idea is that you have these underlying infections that individuals may be dealing with, but then you have something like a head injury that can then move that infection into the brain and now create all sorts of inflammation and all sorts of issues. So there's always immune compromise when it comes to head injuries. Some individuals can develop different types of autoimmune disorders and things like that. So those are important things to realize is that there is a metabolic consequence. Energy becomes less efficient. Your brain becomes hyper excitable. And then your immune system becomes a little bit wonky that then can perpetuate or continue inflammation, can create brain fog, cognitive issues, all these different things. Um, and all these things are important to know because treatments are completely different for each one of them. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the second thing that really occurs with head injuries. And this is disruption in those circuits. This is going from um, high-speed internet to AOL kind of dial-up where it just burr, 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 and taking minutes to hours sometimes to actually dial in, right? So you start to see the, the circuits or the highways become slower, less efficient. They send signals not quite as quick, right? So you have something that's called axonal shearing. So axons or highways are tracks in your brain and they connect different hubs to each other so that you can process quicker, right? So just like copper wiring or different types of wiring for internet, if you alter that and it isn't quite as efficient, that connection becomes slower. And you might notice this as slowness of thought, memory issues, sleep issues, fatigue, dizziness, all sorts of different things, depending on what networks get disrupted. Symptoms come from specific networks getting disrupted. If you disrupt circuits that have to do with integrating your eyes, your inner ear, and your neck, most of the time you get dizzy. You get balance issues. If you alter circuits that have to do with emotional networks and regulating emotion, you may get anxiety. You may get depression. You may get all these different symptoms to where you start crying, you have no reason why. So symptoms are really helpful along with different examination techniques that we'll talk about in identifying what networks just don't seem to be communicating to each other properly, 
right? So these are really the two big things that occur. So we have to identify saying what circuits are not working appropriately. And then from a metabolic standpoint, does the person even have the fuel to make those circuits work appropriately? And this is why it's important that if you suffer from a head injury or have a loved one suffer from a head injury, is that they're working with a doctor that understands all these concepts and integrates all these different things. Because I would argue that if you only do one of them, or you kind of don't pay attention to one of them, you're missing the boat and you're probably not getting the best care that you can, okay? So what are even symptoms that people suffer, right? People feel all sorts of different symptoms, right? But what I find a lot of times is most concussion patients have very similar symptoms, right? Dizziness and vertigo, very common. I see in probably 90% of patients with head injuries, headaches, blurred or double vision, numbness or tingling, weakness, balance issues, memory issues, anxiety and depression, tremors or maybe shaking in the legs or the arms or different things like that, insomnia, another big one, sleep, right? These are only 10 symptoms. Some of you may be saying, well, I suffer from other symptoms as well that weren't listed. And that's definitely possible. Like I said, there's so many symptoms that can occur. These are probably the 10 that I see the most and that I see tend to be most common. But that being said, not everyone's dizziness from a head injury is coming from the same mechanism. So just because you have dizziness doesn't mean that your friend who suffered dizziness from a head injury and got a certain therapy was effective will be effective for you. You need to have it customized to where your dizziness is coming from, from where your headaches are coming from, from where your double vision is coming from. Because although it's the same symptom, what could be causing it can be completely different in most cases. And most of the time it is different. There are similarities, but a lot of times every patient's treatment plan is completely different and customized for them, right? So these are important to know that if you or a loved one possibly, unfortunately, you know, hits their head or is in a car accident or falls and maybe doesn't think that they hit their head, and then all of a sudden you start noticing these symptoms, it's important to realize that those could be a result of a concussion, right? And to seek appropriate management, which we'll talk about in just a second, okay? So what are some of the most common areas that I tend to see become affected? And once again, this is simplified and it's far more complex and there's so many different areas that can be affected. But more, most commonly, these are big areas that I see get affected, right? And a lot of times it's more the parts of the brain that integrate these different systems, Okay, so your visual system, your vestibular system or your inner ear, and then your proprioceptive system. Proprioceptive system is your muscles, your joints, your ligaments, your tendons, everything in your body, right? All three of these systems are your basic senses. They're your basic sensory systems. And the reason I harp on this, and for those of you who know me, know that I harp on this a ton, is because these are the most common things that get disrupted with head injuries the different networks of the brain that integrate these three systems become a little bit wonky. They become a little bit fragile and they don't really communicate with each other in an appropriate manner that they create mismatches. And these systems, when there's alterations in them, can create dizziness, nausea, vomiting, headaches, GI issues, balance issues, um, tremors, sleep, right? It can create all those symptoms that we talked about. That being said, there can be other networks that can be disrupted. Um, but all those other networks that can get disrupted process this information. And so that's why they can create all those similar symptoms. So let's talk about these three systems, okay, and how they may cause symptoms. <clears throat> when we look at your vestibular system or your inner ear, that is what's always detecting gravity. It's letting you know where is your head in the world. When that doesn't work, people get dizzy. They get balance issues. They get brain fog. They get anxious because they don't understand where they are in the world. Really, when you think about your brain, I want you to think about it on a basic level. Your brain is really there for you to interact and to manipulate your environment, right? And everything is based off of that. Your reality of the world is based off of your interpretation of the world around you, right? And so if all of a sudden your inner ear is off, the way you detect or interpret your world is going to be different, your reality is going to be completely different, right? And then there's your visual system. Your visual system is constantly giving you information of where things are in the world around you. And it has to match what your inner ear is saying. 
So your inner ear gives you the starting point. And off of that starting point, your visual system says, now here's this cup relative to me. So I can reach out and grab this cup and I can drink this water. Something that all of us take for granted, but sometimes when people get head injuries, this becomes a very daunting task for them, right? Because these simple sensory systems get disrupted. And if you have an alteration in your inner ear, it can mess with your visual system and vice versa. And then your proprioceptive system and most commonly people's necks, especially in whiplash and head injuries, there can be issues in individuals' necks. And, and if you think about it, your neck and your inner ear have to work very closely together to let you know where your head is. So as I turn my head to the right, I get stretch from, stretch and tightening from muscles in my neck on different sides. And then I get an acceleration signal from my inner ear. And if those things match, I now know that I rotated my head to the right at 500 degrees per second. And now I'm holding it at a certain point, right? When those don't match, all sorts of symptoms can manifest going back to everything from dizziness to things like dystonias, which are abnormal contractions of the neck and people's necks get stuck in different positions, tight necks, headaches, headaches occur from the neck being tight because of this huge mismatch, right? And a lot of times what's happening is that someone now turns their head to the right and their eyes say, okay, we turn to the right. And the inner ear says, we turn to the right. And then the neck says, I think we turn to the left, right? And there's different testing to see if this is going on and think about it. It's like you're having constant motion, not motion sickness, but car sickness constantly. If you think about what car sickness is, is car sickness is a sensory mismatch. You're reading, let's say you're reading a book in a car, your eyes say you're not moving, your inner ear says you're translating form, and then you're bouncing up and down in the seat. None of your sensory systems are matching. And if your brain's healthy enough, you can sort that out and feel okay. But when your brain's not healthy, that will create symptoms. And this is why people may fatigue all day long as their brain is trying to figure out what information is appropriate, right? So head injuries, a lot of times our senses, the way we interpret and integrate our senses becomes very noisy. And our brain doesn't like noise, right? It's getting signals constantly and needs to figure out what are the right signals and what's just junk noise. And it needs to filter that junk noise out so that we can interact with our world, okay? This is a cool picture. Some of you who have seen my presentation see that I use it quite a bit, but this is going back to a lot of those networks that can be disrupted. So you can see the wide variety of different areas of the brain that integrate all these different things. You can see self motion versus object motion. These are all things we take for granted. Um, I'm moving towards something. Am I moving towards it or is it moving towards me? And at what speed, right? If a car is moving at me, I need to get out of the way and judge how fast is it moving. Where's that car in space? Where's my head relative to my body moving? Okay. And then you can see different things. The ego versus allocentric. Ego is where am I in the world? Allocentric is where's the world in reference to me? And it's cool. You can see different areas of the brain create different maps. You can see different parts of your brain create what are called border cells. So they border your environment. So you know everything in your environment. And then you have what are called grid cells that let you know where is everything relative to me on this grid, right? This is why also individuals who suffer head injuries can create memory issues. Where did I put my keys? Where did I park my car? Why did I walk in the room? And sometimes that can be due to issues in sensory systems and that you just lost track of where you're on the world. So how are you supposed to know where you put your keys are? How are you supposed to know where you parked your car or why you walked into the room. So you can see all these things are so interconnected <laughs> and that it's important to know that these things can occur from head injuries and they are treatable. They are manageable. There are things that can be done for them, but the longer they go untreated, the harder they can become to be treated because we create compensations and we stop using those parts of the brain. So then they stop working as well as they should, right? The brain is truly... If you don't use it, you lose it, right? A very important thing to know is that the brain's great at compensating and it will find new ways to allow you to do things that maybe are damaged that don't allow you to do them. But over time, if you don't do those things and you don't exercise the areas of the brain that might have been damaged, they will not work nearly as well in the future. And that's why it's important to get care as soon as possible, okay? So going back to this, what are some more symptoms 
to see if my vision may be involved. Some of you may have experienced these. Some of you may have loved ones that have experienced this. People don't like things being close to them. People with head injuries don't like people in their faces. They don't like when hands are close to their face. And this can be due to issues in the way their eyes track, the way their eyes can look at far targets and near targets. Individuals develop issues reading, eye tracking, eye strain with computer screen, uh, with computer screens, going back to dizziness, double vision, and vertigo. Short-term memory loss. Your vision is so important for attention and memory. If you cannot keep your eyes still on a target because they are shaky or they don't move appropriately from a head injury, you won't be very good at attending to things and your attention will go down. This is what you see in a lot of children with learning disabilities, um, things like ADHD, is there's alterations in their eye movements. There's alterations in their ability to attenuate stimulus and to focus on things, right? They're always moving around. Their eyes are always taking in all this information and they have trouble keeping their eyes still and attending, right? And this is why you can see individuals who may have a previous diagnosing diagnosis of a learning disability and it gets way worse after a head injury. Motion sickness. Individuals may go into grocery stores and now it becomes a nightmare. They get overwhelmed in grocery stores. They get dizzy and disordered in grocery stores or in airports or busy environments with concerts. Some individuals may say, yeah, now when I'm in busy environments, I get super anxious, right? And a lot of times that can just be because it's too much input for their brain, okay? Difficulty making eye contacts in social environments, that comes back to attention. And then inability to tolerate complex visual environments, grocery stores, concerts, all sorts of different things, okay? So these are very common symptoms that you can see secondary to a head injury and can be due to the head injury disrupting the way your eyes are, are able to move into track. And we've done other lectures on eye movements and I plan to do more where we can dive even more in depth just into eye movements and how they're related to concussions. So what do we do? We learned all this information. We learned about signs and symptoms of a concussion, how we define a concussion and and what things can cause a concussion, and then what actually occurs in a concussion. What are the metabolic consequences from a concussion? What happens to the immune system from a concussion? And then what happens to different networks that can create the symptoms that one suffers from a concussion? How do we quantify this? So now some of you may be saying, why have these symptoms? How do we figure out where these are coming from? Okay, all sorts of different testing. Once again, those of you who have had a head injury, probably have gone to either the ER or their primary care. And nothing against either of those. Both are great. But from my experience, hospitals and a lot of primary care areas don't really know what to do with head injuries, right? They're having to deal with so many different things. They're not really educated. They're not really taught. So they just tell people to go rest. But what happens when that doesn't help, right? So what we do is we really take comprehensive health histories. We dive into your history and say, we know that if an individual has diabetes, that's going to affect their outcome from a head injury. If an individual has thyroid issues, that's going to affect their outcome. If a patient has a history of viral infections or uh, tick-borne illnesses like Lyme disease or Babesia or Bartonella, those are going to change the outcome, right? And that's so important to know and to be able to line up with their symptoms to figure out where those are coming from. Because at the end of the day, you're coming to me or someone else with symptoms. And my job is to figure out where those symptoms are coming from. Are they from previous things that now are manifesting from the head injury? Or are they totally unrelated? And then lab work. Most of our patients, we run some form of lab work. It may be very basic for some and nothing really needs to be done. And others, it can be very extensive looking at gut, uh, like stool tests, looking at hormones, um, sometimes genetic testing, looking at infections or autoimmune disorders. And every patient's different, but we're ready with each patient to dive as deep as we need to into lab work and metabolic things to see, do we need to support them more? Once again, an individual who may be, let's say, anemic, maybe iron deficient anemia, far more common in the female population, not going to do very well from a head injury. But if you find that they're anemic and then you support and you improve their anemia or get rid of their anemia, you can help their symptoms tremendously. And sometimes that is what helps them heal from the head injury. But if you don't pay attention to those things and you just start doing vision rehab or vestibular rehab and you're anemic and you hit your head, 
you could be completely missing the boat. And so that's why you have to look at the whole picture, okay? And then a detailed physical, neurological examination, an orthopedic examination. And I would argue that myself and then colleagues of mine um, is very in-depth to what is traditionally done is we're really using the examination to triangulate different parts of the brain that don't seem to be working well. The other thing is what's called video nystagmography or VNG. So this is what you'll get a lot of times at an ENT's office or an audiologist's office um, if you're presenting with dizziness or different things like that. They're goggles that allow us to use infrared lasers to pick up eye movements on the smallest scale. So we can watch the way your eyes move, the way they track, what do they do in light, what do they do in dark. All these tell us so much information about the brain because eye movements are controlled by almost the entire brain. So many different circuits of the brain control different types of eye movements. So your ability to quickly look from one target to another and to be accurate and fast with it, numerous circuits that do that. So when we start to see breakdown in specific eye movements, we can start saying, okay, that's controlled by this area. Huh, what else can we triangulate to tell us, is that area not doing so hot? And then we look at computerized posturography or balance testing. So we use computerized balance testing on different platforms and balance testing is really cool because it allows you to manipulate those three sensory systems that I talked about earlier. Your eyes, your inner ear, and your feet, right? We'll have patients stand on a hard surface, eyes open, eyes closed. So now we're taking away vision. Put them on foam. Now we take away their feet and now they have to rely on their inner ear and their eyes. And then we close their eyes. Now they have to rely on their inner ear. Now we turn their head left, right, forward, back. So we start manipulating all of these systems and see where do they fail? What systems are strong? What systems are weak? And how may those be contributing to one's symptoms and lack of recovering from a head injury? And that mixed with all these other things helps to create a really customized treatment plan to not just treat symptoms, but to treat underlying mechanisms causing symptoms and truly help individuals make hopefully full recoveries from head injuries. Okay. And then lastly, cognitive testing. All these things to look at, are there more issues in um, maybe let's say verbal memory, visual memory, attention, short-term memory, and all these once again give us windows into different regions that are affected. So between the history that tells us could there be pre-existing things to why this person's not recovering, lab work that lets us know are there underlying metabolic issues that are affecting the energy systems of the brain so they can't get better? And then what do the circuits look like? How can we quantify as many different networks in the brain as possible to give us an idea of why one is still dizzy, why one still has a headache, why one may be anxious or depressed after a head injury? And then we can take all that data and create customized treatment plans to affect those things. This is why I argue a lot of the concussion clinics that are out there or the different things I see advertised to clinicians of you know, protocols. Here's what the research says. Here's the protocol for a head injury. Here's the protocol for dizziness. Here's the protocol for vision therapy. Although effective and helps people, I would argue isn't as effective as it can be because everyone's symptoms are completely different and you need an individual who's really going to look at the whole picture and know when to say, yeah, vestibular rehab would be effective or no, you're just anemic and we need to give you iron and that's really what's going to help you and you don't need to waste your time or your money on vestibular rehab. And so it's really important to understand all of those different things, right? And that's how we approach individuals suffering from head injuries. Some other conditions that we work with as well, and this is important and the reason that we work with a lot of these other conditions is that all of these are important when it comes to concussions and all of them can have similar etiologies. So like we talked about today, post-concussive syndrome, migraines, different neurodegenerative conditions, inner ear disorders, things like MS, which come back to autoimmune disorders, um, infections, hormonal issues, gut conditions, things like movement disorders. Because um, once again, those are very common after head injuries. People can create tremors or um, maybe what are called like hyperkinetic disorders to where they may start moving limbs uncontrollably, things like dystonia where muscles start contracting and people can't relax them, or even people become slow and they don't move quite as smoothly. 
or they become slow of thought, or on the other end, their mind's racing. They start creating hallucinations, uh, anxiety, all these different symptoms because of all these different areas that affect them. So this is why we work with a lot of these conditions and understand them is because they're very much related to concussions because concussions pretty much can cause any symptom in the book neurologically. Everything from a movement disorder and to MS to looking like an inner ear condition to creating gut issues, thyroid issues, and hormone imbalances. So that's why it's so important to understand all of them. Right? We try to integrate all of these things to help patients to the best of our ability. Right? And to kind of wrap things up before we take questions is I want to leave you with these few things is act sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, so many of the patients that I tend to see are months to years after head injury. And it just makes it so much more difficult because now you're dealing with time and you're also dealing with all the stress and emotional things that come with it, the traumas and things like that. And that's also why we also have Jake, who is a phenomenal counselor. Um, and some of you in here may have met him before or know of him. Jake is amazing. And it, we thought it was very important to bring on a counselor because we realized that dealing with post-concussive syndrome for a long period of time is so emotionally taxing and stressful. It's an invisible injury. So we want to try to create and give you as many resources as possible to help support you and get you back to right pre-accident or get you back into a place that you can live your life to the fullest. Okay. And then another important thing is it's never too late. So many individuals I see come in and they're so discouraged. It's been a year. It's been two years. No one's helped me. I've been everywhere. And I'm not saying we fix everyone, you know, but a majority of people, there is hope and there's things that can be done. And like I tell patients is, you know, if I think other people or other people need to be brought on the team, we will do that, right? My goal is to get you better or to get the appropriate team together to get you better, right? So it's so important to know it's never too late. The brain can always change and we're learning so much every day, right? So act sooner rather than later, right? And know that it's never too late. And then the important thing too is that I offer free consultations, right? And this is really just to talk to people and to see if I think people would be a good fit for what we have to offer. Before they jump in and we start doing things, I want to see, do I think we can help? Or do I think someone else would be a better fit? So this is something really cool that we offer is an opportunity to sit down for 30 minutes and kind of talk about the case, review the case, see what you've tried, see what you haven't tried, and then say, what do we think is going to be effective for you? And decide, hey, let's get rock and rolling. Or, hey, I think you should really go see uh, Dr. So-and-so, I think they're really going to be able to help you. So something that I'm really happy that we offer is a free consultation and it makes it easier for individuals who are a little bit timid about going into doctor's offices or they're a little timid to spend a ton of money just to chat with someone, right? And this is why I offer the free consult is to just talk and to talk about what's going on and to kind of help guide you through the maze of healthcare because the maze of healthcare can be so daunting and everyone's got the new fix and everyone's got the new pill and everyone's an expert, right? And that's the problem is so many patients spend so much time spending so much money on different things with a bunch of people who really don't know what they're doing, right? So those are the things that I want to leave you with. Like I said, it's myself. Dr. Stedman and Jake um, is our team of three. Um, and then for those of you in the Denver area, we are on the radio um, on uh, KLRZ The Source or 560 um, AM or 100.7 FM. <laughs> We're on there 1230 every Monday. It's either myself, Jake, or or um, Dr. Stedman, and we're talking about different health issues. Usually, honestly, we're talking about different things related to the webinar we're out to give, but if you're interested in some more of the content that we're putting out there or free information, um, you can find us on the radio show um, along with these webinars. So that is all I have for today. Um, like I said, we also are offering telehealth during this pandemic. We are up full and running, taking appropriate safety precautions, but for those that are out of state or don't feel comfortable, we do offer telehealth, All right? So this is our number. So if you're interested in learning more about our clinic or chatting with myself about uh, your case or a loved one's case, please give us a call and Lindsay and Sandy can get something scheduled. Um, but at this point, I would like to open it up to 
uh, questions. If anyone has any questions in regards to the presentation, I'd love to spend the last few minutes answering some questions. Um, and if not, then we'll wrap up for the evening. So uh, if you have a question, just go into the attendee chat area and fire away. And yeah. So let's see, we have a question. So if one has several persistent symptoms that overlap with previous diagnosis, does one need to pursue concussion possibilities specifically? Great question. Um, it, it, it's an important thing to discuss, right? So one individual, like we talked about, may have a previous diagnosis of, of thyroid issues or um, chronic viral infections or hormone issues. And what can happen sometimes is that the body is dealing with those things and maybe they're only causing some problems. But we know that when we hit our head, it creates all sorts of immune dysregulation or can make hormone issues worse or it can make fatigue worse or things like that. So it can make pre-existing conditions worse. And that's important to know to say maybe the catalyst that made these symptoms worse or these previous diagnoses work was a concussion, right? Because then we may say, okay, rehabbing the brain or doing these different things and getting that under control uh, can be important or can lead us into different mechanisms that may be causing it. So that's a great question. And it's definitely important to know uh, if maybe a concussion is what set off or made pre-existing symptoms worse because it definitely happens all the time. So great question. Um, so if there's any more questions... Well, if no one has any more questions, oh, here we go. Perfect. So, uh, great question. Can you share anything more about chiropractic therapy for concussion? Great question. So, um, myself and Dr. Stedman um, do have a background in chiropractic, so we will utilize a lot of those things when necessary. So, chiropractic can be very powerful for concussions, but it's a tool where we need to understand when and when not to use it. So going back to is a lot of times the neck can be affected from a concussion or from a whiplash accident. And when the neck a lot of times is the culprit and causing some of the symptoms, this is where things like uh, manual therapy, whether it be adjustments or myofascial work or things like dry needling and acupuncture can be very effective. And this is where you see patients where they say, I had a concussion, my chiropractic healed me. And then you have a lot of patients where they say, I had a concussion, I went to a chiropractor, and it made me feel terrible. It made me feel worse because I look at chiropractic as a tool. And it's a, one of the tools in my toolbox of many, and I choose when's going to be the appropriate time to utilize it. So a lot of my patients, I adjust. We do myofascial work. We do, you know, send out for dry needling. And there's other ones. I don't go anywhere near their neck, you know, or we do some inner ear rehab or some vision therapy, get them stable, and then we start doing a little bit more work on their neck. So chiropractic therapy can be very effective, but it's important to know when to use it. And so if you're going to a practitioner who is preaching, saying that chiropractic is, you know, going to be the main thing to fix, I would be a little hesitant on listening to that because we have to understand what is actually occurring with chiropractic therapy and how it's affecting the brain. And then once we know that, we know when it can be efficient for a brain injury and when it can be inefficient. Because like I said, it can be the best thing in the world for some patients. And for other patients, it can be the last thing you need to do. And that's something that we look at and really pay attention to to see when will it be therapeutic to use. Um, and then how do we want to adjust patients? Do we want to do something that's a little bit low impact? Do we want to do something that's a little bit more impact and high velocity, you know, whether it's using, you know, an activator, one of the clickers or, you know, manual adjustment, or maybe even just soft tissue work. So um, I hope that answers your question in regards to chiropractic therapy and for concussions. I think it can be very, very effective, um, but you need to know when to use it and when not to use it. Okay. Uh, any more questions?
Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed it and, um, and that it was good information. So for all of you um, that are new, we, like I said, we will be doing these um, once a month and have been doing them once a month. Um, we're trying to kind of post all the past webinars on some of our social media. So actually, I post a lot on my Facebook and my Instagram. So my Instagram is drdr.perry.maynard. And that is also my Facebook as well. So you can follow me on those platforms where I will post a lot of the previous webinars where we've talked about dizziness, autoimmune, uh all sorts of different things. And um, honestly, if there's different information that you want to hear, feel free to call and let our front desk know and then they can let us know and, and we can create content that you want to hear because I'm here to do this for you guys, for patients, for loved ones to help educate and give you more information. So um, yeah, so if there's no more questions, then we will wrap it up. And um, I hope everyone has a great evening. Everyone stay safe and healthy. Um, and we will be having another webinar next week. Um, I think it will be Dr. Stedman. I'm not sure what he's talking about. I think he may be talking on migraines. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for that. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much.